All right, all right. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to this uh, special edition episode of the Ujama Hour. Uh, I am Michael Tekken-Strode, uh, coordinator of the Coconut Collaborative and a member of Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group, uh, coming to you here on this broadcast uh, where we uh, are launching a curious exploration of the Black social and solidarity economy through intimate and formal conversation. Uh, we are here to tell stories, the stories that live behind um, the organizing, the great organizing, and the, the great cultural work that is happening in our communities, especially and specifically around this topic of uh, cooperative economics and cooperation in general. Um, we are a space uh, which is grounded in the exploration of all things, um, e all things economy. So, you know, what is this notion of the economy that expands um, beyond the, the, the boundaries of the financial beyond the boundaries of exchange, you know, but that live within within ourselves and within our communities in the ways that we go about meeting our needs, you know. So what is an economy? And, you know, certainly we asked in the podcast trailer, what is an economy for? Um, an economy is specifically um, for the purpose of meeting the needs um, of of folks in the community, meeting meeting the, the social, cultural, meeting the, the total material needs of, of the community. And um, that is what we that is what we are here to explore and expand upon in the, the Ujima Hour. Um, those are the things that we we follow up upon in terms of you know engaging um, with the folks who are are building those uh, these economies on the ground. Uh, and and so certainly we are delighted to have you all here for another special edition episode. We do these special edition episodes in honor of. Um, of the of Kwanzaa, you know the 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 cultural remembering, the cultural celebration um, among Black folks in the Americas, um, and you know, and 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 we're basically are, are grounding ourselves in principles that we uh, hold and we retain um, from our sojourn from you know motherland to these shores, um, things that we 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 think you know are values um, that our ancestors would celebrate. We think of values that that our ancestors held. Um, we are remembering, we are trying to root ourselves in those values. And so that is that is why we do what we do. And, and, and that is why we are here today, you know, on this fourth day of Kwanzaa, which honors something called Ujama, which is uh, generally interpreted as cooperative economics. Um, but, you know, um, and, and this this is a, a funny quip from uh, my sister Dara around um, using what she said, uh, don't use that that Kwanzaa Swahili. You know, when you go to the you know the motherland, you talk to folks who speak Swahili because they don't say that's that's not what that means. <laughs> but it's okay, you know, it's okay. We we are all remembering, we are all rerooting, we are all relearning. And to that point, you know, uh, Ujima is is actually um, uh, more closer to the term familyhood, right? Um, as we uh, noted in a previous episode, when we talked to uh, Dr. Kamal Rashid about the Ujama villages and the the Ujama uh, form of African socialism that Julius Nyerere uh, implemented in Tanzania, uh, grounded in this notion that you know a family is is that is a root economy, um, and 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 we want to you know uh, make sure that we are are, are looking at family in, in, in quite a, in, a, in a much different way than you know we traditionally interpret it, right? You know. Um, in, in, in this sort of Western interpretation, family is the boundaries of the household, right? Um, but, you know, in, in, in plenty of other indigenous spaces, the family, um, you know, might be the clan. The family might be an entire village. The family, the family is an expansive territory um, that, you know, we, we can build upon um, when, we start, when we begin to think about where, what we are doing in terms of an economy and specifically a cooperative economy. Um, so... This uh, principle is, is uh, named as to build and maintain our own stores, shops, and other businesses and, pro and to profit from them together. And certainly for those who have uh, watched this broadcast before, uh, you know that, that we um, you know, consider that a, a bit of a consumerist or a consumption-focused notion of cooperative economics. Um, but you know, we, we want to make sure that we highlight and put a bold point on that building aspect. Um, you know, and... and um, in fact, you know, when, when we did talk to Kamal, uh, Kamal Rashid in the previous broadcast, um, you know, about two years back, um, he noted that, uh, that, that Ujima as a principle, as a, as, a, as a value in Kwanzaa, is one of the, the few principles that sort of has an, what he called an institutional mandate. Um, so this notion that, you know, Ujima calls us to actually build institutions that are, you know, multi and cross-generational. 
um, that live beyond us, um, you know, and, and that, that serve the needs of communities um, well after we ourselves are no longer here. So um, before I, I bring on the, the guest for today, you know, I'll just read this reflection. You know, I've been reading uh, some of these reflections from uh, my 2013 um, writings um, that were just, you know, reflections that I was writing on the principles at the time. Um, and it is certainly, you know, an opportunity to see uh, how I have grown in, in the course of seven years um, and things that, you know, I might actually change both in terms of language and in terms of thought. So I offer this, uh, this reflection in that spirit and in that service. So where shall I begin on this one? Um, yeah, because I don't actually have the image up. Hmm. I'll start with Brother Kamal's uh, quote. So Brother Kamal um, had a quote uh, that he, he'd often tell to us uh, back when we were you know, in organizational life together. Um, it was a line from a poem that called The Blood Never Dries on the Warrior's Spear. Um, and so this reflection begins, uh, war functions through two distinct strategic expressions, offense and defense. Um, these two areas often find themselves deeply intertwined for when you are not directly engaged in combat, you are fortifying your resources in defense of any potential threat. Uh, while we don't draw the, the lesson from imperial culture, which directs us to wage offensive war to the point of mutual destruction, we can understand economic strategy as a defensive technique, which ensures that our community can indeed be a self-determined entity. When you have no economic strategy, you are always subject to the investment decisions of others and therefore subject to their shifting interests, which have very little impetus to consider your own. Economic protectionism is criticized in this era of globalization as an economic weakness, but absent this protectionism, communities are subjected to such phenomena as retail leakage in which the absence of vital commercial sectors inside one's own community mean that, mean that you are forced to spend the bulk of your dollars outside of the community. The free market should, um, quotes, <laughs> the free market uh, should dictate if there is sufficient demand for a commercial sector in a place then one would be located there. But the rise in consumerism and cheaply priced goods for multinational commercial entities means that smaller competition is effectively priced out and unable to balance income against expense. In a society where we always seek the cheapest price, we rarely pay the cost render, we, we very rarely pay the cost required to render services and make entities in that society self-sustaining. Cooperative economics requires that we reassess the things that we value it is not sufficient to simply talk about buying from black businesses if we are only discussing the same unprincipled consumerism with a black face. We need to discuss a true economic strategy and draw ourselves away from the notion that economics is merely a discussion of dollar values. What are the alternative options for us to engage in economic and commercial activity with one another? Where do trade, bartering, and non-standard currency fit into our economic planning? Cooperative economics should also inspire in us an appreciation of the ancient arts the industrial age has spoiled us into the notion that rapidly available, cheaply priced, and mass-produced goods are the preferred option, which again make us less willing to pay the true cost associated with rendering a service. We must revisit those arts of growing, weaving, harvesting, animal husbandry, soap making, carpentry, woodworking, and other forms of craftsmanship. We should engage them, engage in them ourselves so that we can truly appreciate the work of those who take the time to make them a lifestyle. These arts render us self-sufficient as a community and make us and would make us less dependent upon the mechanics of industry which compel us to think that we cannot move forward without its trappings um so again you know a reflection from 2013 um uh, seven years ago you know long enough back um uh, that you know i can see um i can see a little bit of the preachiness in that right you know i mean some elements there you know i i'd I probably blot out and be like oh stop stop doing that dog do. And it's especially to the extent that I spoke to Baba Fred Carter of Black Oak Center recently, and you know, and one of the things that he talked about in our long, our, our our ongoing conversations was this notion that everyone wants to be a food broker, but no one want to get their hands dirty. So it's important that we recognize, um, in terms of cult in creating an economy, recognize that we we cannot design from the point that we are now without really looking at the entire scale and the entire scope and all of the other things that are involved in that economy and recognize that we gotta we gotta walk our way back up the supply chain, you know, and and until we um until we have, you know, um elements and aspects of all of the economy represented um in what we are doing and what we are thinking about. Uh so that's uh, you know a bit of a brief um, you know engagement around this notion of um, Ujamaa and the cooperative economics. 
Um, so, you know, with that, I, I want to go ahead and bring our guests in. Uh, so we've got, you know, two guests today. Um, we, we've got uh, Deidre Somerville um, of Isuzu Chicago uh, and, you know, a, a fellow fellow traveler, fellow member in Cooperation, Collaboration, Study and Working Group. Um, and then we have uh, Yavit Holtz of Cowrie Village and uh, Baobab, the Bay Area Organization of Black-Owned Businesses. Um, and Deidre and Yvette uh, have joined today for this special episode, you know, to really ground us in the SUSU practices, rotating savings and credit associations, uh, which have appeared throughout the world, wherever people in the African diaspora found themselves settling on the margins of the economy. We have found a way to cooperate. We have found a way to build upon these practices. And we have found a way to, to, to hold ourselves together, um, even as, you know, society was, was, was trying to diminish us and, and, and you know, tear away um, what little we were able to gain. Um, so with that, you know, I want to go ahead and, and introduce our guest, uh, Deidre Somerville and uh, Yavet Holtz. Welcome to the Ujama Hour. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, yes. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you both very much for being here. So, um, Deidre, why don't you just, you know, give a bit of an introduction uh, yourself, you know, um, from, of, of, you know, your, I mean, your, your practice and the work that you do, and then, you know, um, how you feel connected to this uh, principle of Ujamaa today. Sure, sure. Um, I have uh, been in the Chicago area now for the better part of 25 years, give or take. Uh, well, more like 22, 23 years, uh, give or take. And my time here has been building relationships with uh, people from various um, communities uh, related to organizing, fundraising, uh, housing, uh, housing issues. And what I've settled on recently is that um, something that I've always held as a view is that we definitely need to think about ways to uh, get back to some ideas of reclamation, uh, which is some of the work we've been doing, out, as you know, in Co-op for Live, but also in terms of uh, women-centered spaces. And so my goal in establishing in SUSU was to um, have a place for reclamation uh, related to uh, the practice of Isusu. Uh, and so the revolving institution, as you talked about, the Isusu is something that's, as you mentioned, has been around for many, many years, many centuries, one can say even. Um, if you include, uh, you know, the, the origins in Yoruba, Edo, and other traditions in, um, in Nigeria. Uh, so, as those traditions have traveled, I've studied and over many years. As those studies have, uh, those traditions have traveled to Trinidad, to different parts of of, uh, of Latin America and uh, in the West Indies, and even in my own family history. Um, I can't mention my connection to this principle without mentioning my foremothers, um, my grandmother, my great grandmothers and grandmothers, actually grandmothers, great grandmothers, um, and others in my family who actually had those practices that I've either been personally exposed to while growing up or have some knowledge through stories um, while, while growing up. So the knowledge of cooperation, cooperation um, economic cooperation is something that uh, I personally grew up with in Richmond, California. So Yvette and you and I have a little something in common. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Bay Area girl. From San Francisco, Not one of the yeah, one of the one of the many, 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 many families that travel from either Texas or Louisiana to the Bay Area, uh, and I grew up in Richmond during a time when uh, my great grandmother and uh, her family rezoned an area of Central Richmond for livestock back in the forties and fifties. And uh, they had chicken coops in their backyard. They traded, you know, fresh ham from someone who raised pigs around, literally around the corner of 25th and 24th in Maine. Um, my grandmother raised chickens, raised rabbits, raised, um, and then so we, we would trade eggs. I would, you know, we would trade uh, many, many things with each other. Um, I, in some ways it was, um, so many things that I relied upon just in my neighborhood because many of the families there really tried to build some sense of community, um, not in this idea of self-sufficiency, but just 
as an idea of uh, making sure that everybody had what they needed. Uh, but we didn't think of it as, as what we term it now, self-sufficiency. Um, uh, it was interdependency, more or less. And so those principles, the principles of Ujamaa really have been a big part of my life from that time. Um, uh, I, the first time I tasted an egg from the store, I was 15 years old and I thought it was, <laughs> I thought it was gross. <laughs> Um, you know, my sister and I were, were, were laughing actually about how, um, you know, we used to argue with our friends at school about the fact that they used to keep put their eggs in the refrigerator, you know, and I never thought about the significance of the life that I had um, stemming from the fact that we ate fresh eggs every day um, and that we had access to fresh ham and we had access to uh, people who are dressmakers, people who were bakers, people who braided hair, people who um who did things for each other um as a matter of a system that we didn't call a system but that we all understood because we all en engaged in the system daily regularly um and so uh, this practice really to me is a reflection of something that i've inherited um and that i'd like to use um in contributing to that in my current life now in chicago um through the asus to chicago um, and giving um, giving folks a chance to uh, look at reclamation through how we how the, how we look at ourselves and the energy of money. So that's a little bit about me. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, um, so Yavette, you know, uh, why don't you uh, bring it bring us bring uh, draw draw into this conversation? Tell us about your relationship with the Susu and how you connect with this concept of Ujima. Um, you know, that's a beautiful telling, Deirdre. I'm so glad you shared that. Because, um, you know, in my coming up, I did, I mean, I, we did and didn't. We did a lot of sharing and uh, reciprocal support like that. But it didn't turn out to be as much around food. Because we, you know, though my family also came from the South, Oklahoma mm -hmm. and uh, Alabama through into mm -hmm. California. My great grandparents uh, had a farm in Madeira where I, okay. to this day, still know some farmers in that area. But I mm -hmm. come from the generation where, uh, you know, it was the goal and the objective to get out of that so you could get more into, you know, like the, we get everything exactly, you know, our, our rights matter and we want access to everything that has been withheld from us. So the goal and the and the energy was outward. It was, let me get up out of this uh, uh, farm town and go into the city where I can really, you know, uh, um, realize my true goals and realize, uh, you know, my true self and, and get my, my equal rights and, you know, not be restricted or withheld or oppressed from opportunity. So, my immediate nuclear family was involved a lot in, you know, um, what I consider to be the rat race, you know, getting the um, degree and the advancement and the, uh, and the uh, promotions within your, uh, the business you're working for, the corporation you're working for, and getting bigger and fancier houses and, and things like this. And there's nothing wrong with that. I, I understand that you know there's a certain um, goal of um, to achieve and and be seen in that way. But I feel like the circle back to that life is what I've really been um, to the, the the life of interconnectedness is where I've, the rest of my adult life has been. Um, I spent some time out of the country, just like you were talking about, Deidre, and became acquainted with, you know, um, a different kind of lifestyle. Living in Mexico in uh, in the early 2000s uh, for a few years, I really did get to be in a Pueblo situation and seeing folks doing more and more of that kind of interconnected life and being less and less stressed. And then remembering back, well, you know, Though my family was, uh, uh, what I, the word I want to say, ambitious uh, in the status quo of America, we also did have those roots of, well, I might not have potatoes to trade for your chickens, 
but I'll watch your kid while you go off to night school mm -hmm. so that I can go on Tuesdays and Thursdays. That's and right. You, you, you know what I'm saying? It was that kind yeah. of thing. Um, oh, you need to borrow a car? Okay, yeah, you can borrow my car for a little bit and I'll, you know, I'll uh, do what I gotta do from home until you get back, until you bring the car back, that's that right. kind of thing. That's right, so that's it, right, that's a big part of the culture of the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. You know, and so uh, it, that kind of uh, percolated to the top. And when I was returning back from Mexico, I, I really could see so starkly how many of us have been kind of washed into that flow, washed into that stream of let me get mine, I need those Jordans, I need that Tesla, I need that, you know, whatever it is. So I just began with this cowrie village because I understood what cow that cowrie shells were the original, you know, or very early uh, form of commerce uh, currency. And using that as a little touchstone to remind people, you know, we already know what we need to do. There's a lot of um, opportunities in that system that are not afforded to us. What we do know how to do is create our own. And, it, mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's stronger when we're working together. So just introducing all sorts of different alternatives, doing some, uh, exper you know, building on what I had rediscovered. And from there came Cowrie Village, which is an economic umbrella of ideas of uh, alternative and, and sovereign economics. So understanding that economy is the care of home and, you know, in its root form, in, in the language that we currently use, um, that there's a lot of ways uh, to be participatory and, and um, you know, employ what we already know. So we started something called Barter to the People, which is a pop-up market uh, based solely on barter and, and a whole kind of system behind that to make it easier to do, to take the bother out of barter. There's a lot of aspects mm -hmm. of barter that, that people have a hard time wrapping their heads around, especially when we're so conditioned to deal with, you know, um, the dollar currency, the fiat currency. So we, we started with barter to the people. We also brought in what we are called rudical gathering, which is a, a, a juiced up version of a susu where we basically um, helped folks pull themselves, you know, pull their, their resources together and distribute the funds amongst each other, but also to um, save some aside to invest in community for the things that they want to see and making those decisions themselves without the involvement of banks or any other institutions, which is just such an important uh, exercise in self-sufficiency practice. Um, and then Baobab, the Bay Area Organization of Black-Owned Businesses. And that's kind of like, well, if commerce and commercialism, capitalism is really rooted in you, to the point where you can't feel comfortable yet participating in barter or susu activities, then here's an opportunity to uh, to keep the dollar circulating within the community and make the connections that way. Because really, all of those are opportunities to grow trust, trust in ourselves mm -hmm. and trust in each other. And the more of that we have, you know, the stronger our networks are. So. Yeah, and on top of doing that, I have a massage practice that is busy and, and thriving and I and I feel really connected to that healing practice and being personally connected with folks, you know, on a on a cultural or a societal level, I feel very connected, but that one on one um, healing, uh, those opportunities are, are priceless. And then I and then I am mom to to now near grown young men who uh yeah i hope i hope they see and benefit from all of this work that i'm doing and i think they do mm -hmm. um so there were two uh, important trust uh, touchstones at the end there uh trust and healing 
Um, so Deidre, I I want to I want to honor you know your healing work as well or the work you do in healing spaces. Um, so if you can maybe both bring that into the conversation, but talk a little bit about the culture that's required to ground in these spaces of the susu and money sharing. You know, just uh, maybe help us to understand both aspects of that trust, healing, and culture. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, it, thank you for sharing your, your healing practice too, Yvette. Um, my work in healing deals uh, primarily in divination. Um, how we show divination, in fact. Um, yeah. and, um, I've been initiated to the Mysteries of Ocean for nearly 18, well, actually nearly 19 years now. <laughs> Keep track of it. Um, He's a reading. And, yes. Yes. Uh, so um, that practice also is one on one and collective in that sense. And and actually, um, I have to credit Oshun with uh, with the inspiration and the support of uh, making uh, the Asusu possible. And I think one thing that uh, in terms of healing that's been really, really helpful and useful in terms of uh, establishing and, and, and maintaining the Asusu is uh, recognizing uh, everyone's ability to be uh, be themselves in the space. We 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 about snatching off masks in in the space when we're together. Wow. I, that's really a big big part of it. Um, giving people a chance to really uh, build a sense of and cultivate a sense of really real trust, so we can really get to some heart issues around money. Uh, looking at our standards of integrity, what are they? You're naming them, um, finding them and naming them and holding space for our own personal standards of integrity that, that are not driven by external realities or driven by external expectations, but what do you hold as true for you to yourself? Uh, how does that relate to who you see yourself in through, your, through the eyes of your ancestors, through the eyes of your, your people who, who care about who care about you? Um, what are your life intentions for yourself? Um, my life intentions are to be um, um, a, a good healer, a good mother, um, and um, and um, and committed to the the well being of my people. That doesn't assign me a title that uh, that I hold with my job or anything else. It assigns me a life role that I I I know is connected to the energy of money. So having everyone align themselves and name that for themselves and hold a space where they can build a sense of community around that, those ideas for themselves. Uh, looking at um, all of these things and looking at those energy conduits that, uh, that we oftentimes, um, we oftentimes clog that, de that, that um, in some ways diminish our capacity to be uh, connected positively with the, with the work that we want to do that supports our life intentions and is what supports our standards of integrity. So looking at all of those questions and issues and holding space for people to be uh, able to um, explore those honestly and earnestly with, with a, within a trusted space. Um, and, uh, and we built a sisterhood around it. Um, and it's, it's so interesting yeah, that what you've said around that, the idea of, of holding space, not only for us to have the revolving um, uh, process amongst all of us, we we finished our first round of this past, this year in 2020, okay, we into our second round. Thank you, we, we uh, and it's, it's finished successfully um, and, um, and we expanded from our first round. We have folks waiting to come in. So now we have a second round. We've nearly doubled the number of people in the first round. So it's it's been going wow. very well. Congratulations! Very well. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so so we, we're continuing to do that work and expand um, our capacity to do. Actually, interestingly, what you've talked about, we've talked about how we can. Many of us are eager to really start to build ourselves as a credit institution, not only for ourselves, but for uh, for others in the community. We see so many businesses here that we would love to have a su supporting hand to 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 um, to, um, to build that exchange with, so that we can support each other. Because their support of the SUSU is also our our support of them. It's it's, inter it's an inter it's an exchange. It's an, um, we consider that an exchange. So we've been thinking about that, working towards that. That's a goal that we've, we've shared. We just wanna make sure we have everyone's um, 
shared understanding of how that can support everyone in the, in the group in terms of how we see community as part of our work. But that's something we've been eagerly looking into doing. Um, and yeah, you know, um, you know, oh, sorry, go ahead. oh no, go for it, go for it, go for it. Oh, I was just gonna um, offer that that it's a challenge. It, I mean, mm -hmm. I know you know we completed I want to say four or five circles, but our circles are so different in that. Um, well, I don't know how so different they are from what you're doing, but they're so different than what I first initially understood as a susu in the research and everything that I was doing. And mm -hmm. what we kind of crafted was a way, as I was saying, to set a small portion aside so that um, at the end, everyone got whatever they, you know, the distribution was. We distributed the funds every month, every time we mm -hmm. came together. And we did all sorts of, you know, wonderful uh, ceremony and ritual and cleansing around those dollars so that the intention behind them would amplify with the energy that we put on them. But then we mm -hmm. also set the small portion of that aside each month so that at the end of the circle, we would all come together and make a grand decision about where the funds we had would go. And um, for our particular version, we kind of capped it at, um, I think it was seven people, seven participants. And the reason okay. for that was because uh, every time we came together, we all brought the same amount and whatever wasn't set aside was distributed to whoever's turn it was to receive. And what that meant was if you were the first one to receive, you had to make an absolutely undying commitment to attend every subsequent meeting and bring right. the same amount of money, right. even though right. you may have been the right. first one or vice versa. You may be right. the last one on the list. And so if, if the agreement was to bring $100 every time, you know, if you're gonna wait until the seventh month to get your $700 or $750 or $650, whatever it is, that's a long time to be paying $100 every month to get your payout at the end. So that's part of why we capped it that way. Um, and it was it, every time a gigantic journey. The other pieces, and, and, I, and I'd love to hear how you all handle this, but mm -hmm. we were an absolutely non-punitive environment, which meant mm -hmm. if you made that commitment to bring the $100 and you didn't bring the $100 or you called and said, oh, I can't make whatever, this was a gigantic issue, but not a punitive issue. Right. And so the whole point is some sister down the line is not going to get what she's supposed to get because you that is that how you want to roll? You know, is that how you want to roll? So it was an incredible, super big, gigantic journey and not at all easy and really very, very intense, which is part of the reason why it has uh, kind of, it's taken not a back seat, but the forefront is led by other projects within Cowrie Village at this point, because that a uh, gigantic lot of work. Now I know that there are some folks out here in Oakland who, and in the Bay Area who are doing it and doing it great. And, and in working it more like a credit and banking system, I, from what I'm observing, I would love to get updated from them about where they are now. Um, and then there's also, yeah, and I, I reached out to my sister Kita Price, Marquita, uh, to see if I could get her to chime in. Yeah. Um, but I, but I'm going to connect you with her, Michael, so that in the future, you know, she might be invited. Um, but uh, what I was going to say is that there's also organizations that don't call themselves SUSUs, but are acting like that out here in response in a lot of the same way that you were talking about with response to like this uh, pandemic and how the businesses have been really at a disadvantage um, for so many reasons. So there's things like the Oakland Black Business Fund, um, the the AAACC, uh, as African American Arts and Culture Complex, the, um, well, there's just a, a handful that have been really um, collecting fun funds from community, mm -hmm. packaging them together, and then putting them back out to community in ways that um, banks and other lending, lending institutions haven't been able to, haven't had the will to, haven't, period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. yeah. 
Yeah. So we have we uh, we run our and that the issue you talked about is a there is a very critical one. So we established from the beginning because uh, some of us, as I mentioned, my el my ancestors and elders and my family have been a part of the Susu, but it was called Social and Leisure Club. And so, and me and another person who um, who my was my is my girl. She's the person that my first Susu sister I went to to talk to about this. Who also happens to be initiated to Oshun through Condom Blay. Um, she and I talked and she understood right away what I was getting at. She said, girl, we, we talked, you're talking about social and leisure clubs. I said, yes, that's exactly what I thought. She says, so, you know, I, you know, and so we talked about um, establishing the house as a part of the exclusive. So there's, the house is an account that is also acts as a member of a SUSU. So everybody mm -hmm. pays the house first. And so it, when every whomever comes into a SUSU, that they pay the house first. So there's always a, a fund that's available for any member if at some point in some month they uh, have are having difficulty ma making their payment. And so everyone has at least that one chance through the through the the fund to make that payment back. Um, and so that's that has worked awesome. out really well. Use the, the, the set aside a little bit like that. But I love how you made that um, that decision, that commitment at the start, because yeah. to be like, oh, we have this kitty, but now are we gonna pull from the kitty to pay for that? I don't know how you guys wanna do it. But if you have that as an agreement before you begin, mm -hmm. that just takes all the stress out of it. That's beautiful. Yeah, so everyone knows who joins this, who knows that they have to pay the house first. And the house is is where, um, and so the house account and, and there are members of the house of the of the Asusu who have paid the house account um, over and beyond. Like when we had our new round, only the new members had to pay the house, but there mm -hmm. are members who have been a part of the first round who chose to pay the wow. house, just as a matter of commitment to Asusu and to growing right. our Asusu. So about right. five members, four or five members paid the house. They didn't have to pay the house. So that Beautiful. was really that was actually really cool, and um, and so and how many you know, how many participate? How many um, how many hands are in the CC? Yeah, we had yes, we had we started it with six. We ended up with uh, with twelve in this second round. But then one person, as they say, uh, origin in the original way of saying it, lost their way on the road. So we now down okay. to eleven. So, you know, mm -hmm. I worked with the person as much as I could, you know, gave them an opportunity to, but they never actually contributed. So uh, we had to have a parting of ways because they next act, never actually contributed um, in as part but of the Did you make so, that decision yourself or was that a decision by the, in, it was by the, the council? It was it was collective and it was collective with that person in mind too, because I we didn't want to make that decision without their being in some ways, um, uh, either, you know, talk to about it and, and work with for it. We worked for actually for three months with the person. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's really so it's it's such a challenge. Yeah. 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 Super so super we, we, we had open conversations and, and what I like to do is, um, I have, you know, if there's if whatever people, wherever people are during the month, if they are not able to make the payment at the day on the day that we need it, I work with people. I work with people mm -hmm. um, at five bars. You know, if they have an agreement, uh, I'll have my payment by this date. So I couldn't make it because this didn't come through or that didn't come through. But I, I want to commit to make it on this date. We They make it on that date. And so mm -hmm. um, in terms of getting the payment um, out uh, every month, sometimes that delays it. But people want people to participate. So people are willing to wait a week for their payment, their payout, if it means that somebody's going to be able to participate. Because everyone's because everyone pays uh, in each month, and that's the idea. So uh, mm -hmm. so that so mm -hmm. it it helps. So we have so we had an opportunity this this time to vote to have either a shorter cycle with people having multiple payments per month because we doubled our our um, our membership, or for everyone just to have uh, a chance to wait till their turn for the, which will be in some cases eleven months. And everyone right. voted to wait. People said, "No, I'd rather. I would rather wait." 
for yeah. everyone to get their payout because it it because people really wanted everyone to celebrate each other and that's a part of what we do we celebrate uh uh each other when that happens and um and people like to say i'm gonna do this they like to tell us what they plan on doing with with uh right. with the mm -hmm. with, with mm -hmm. they what they receive and they talk about and mm -hmm. some people have been able to grow their businesses uh mm -hmm. that they've had uh, we have a, one soper who has been able to literally grow her business and invest in it, and she's flourishing. She's getting much larger orders. She's she's been she's done a couple of weddings, wedding gifts for her. And so That's she's been wonderful. doing really phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal work. So it. it's been really great to see how people have have invested in themselves and and invested in um, in their businesses because most most many of us I think are have some businesses that we support through our system that's spectacular and I mean you know the thing is the the economic growth that you're talking about is is phenomenal and and it's so it's so empowering you know to be able to be you know the source and the recipient of that that growth but yeah. i feel like a lot of the time the focus i'm i always was trying to have on was how you know much community and how much trust is growing right there and i don't know how folks uh become to participate in your susu but in in ours it was like you needed an invitation, but mm -hmm. only by one person. So right. you might be invited and you know one person in, but you don't know anybody else. But the mm -hmm. level of intimacy and the level of, um, yeah, trust that comes from that regular meeting, that confidence, that non-punitive response, just phenomenal. And I mean, still some folks from our sisters are connected that hadn't been before. And they stay connected. Yeah, yeah I, that's happened with us. We've even had we had our first movie night uh, this past month. <laughs> uh, it just just building ways to build community that uh, help us to stay connected um, and and further explore our issues around uh, what what's what's bringing more healthy relationships with with how we view our energy with money. So it's been really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Congratulations again. And I, I, I love all the autonomous dialogue and exchange that just happened there. You know, I hope folks were listening and they were plugged in. Like, I mean, that was a susu electricity happening, you know, right there. In the you know, so that's why I jumped you know it. Because, you know, I wanted to let that let that connection keep thriving. And so I won't disrupt too much, but, you know, um, there, you know, and we certainly don't have to give uh, give too much time to uh, susus that are not authentic susus. But does anyone want to say anything about mm -hmm. this sort of recent, you know, not necessarily recent, but you know, resurgent phenomena of you know looms and you know um, other sorts of yeah non susu practices calling themselves susu. Just throwing that in there. Yeah, the 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 pyramid schemes. Yes. Yeah. Let's just call it. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. You go ahead. You start, Deidre. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, my head, my mind was going there even uh, as be right before uh, he brought that up. Um, we were talking because there is something really seriously lost in those frames. Um, I mean, the ones that I've heard of have been overly complicated and um, uh, really not at all understanding really the point of it, which is that everyone benefits. You know, they're designed for people to be uh, to be insiders and outsiders. They're designed to uh, to create schemes that make it hard for people to understand what wheels are turning, how and where and why, um, and and, the, and it undermines the collectivist nature of Esusu. Um, the, the research that has been done on Esusu and Susu in Trinidad and Potomitan and in, in, in Haiti all point to uh, several, I think, key questions and issues that uh, that are really, I think, braided through even what our discussion is, and that is. Uh, that um, that there is a sense of collective good that comes with it, and that and that there's a collective good and accountability even that comes with the practice, 
that is uh, really fundamental to it. And uh, there's a whole sense of, um, of uh, what the person who actually starts or initiate it, what their role is, not only even if you look at the Yoruba roots of it, spiritually as well as, uh, as materially. Um, and you know, in, in traditional Isusu in Yoruba land, um, in order for certain people to have certain roles within Isusu, because there's the head and then there's people who might, who bring other people in, and those people may be heads of roads, so to speak. And there's even divination done to determine those mm -hmm. folks in those roles. Uh, so to me, that says something about the sacredness of this, of this practice um, mm -hmm. and how there's a whole sense of trust and a whole sense of um, how this work is tied to the destiny of individuals. And a lot of these other practices don't honor um, or don't even have a connection to how um, what, what, what people's uh, possible destiny is, and not only in terms of being able to contribute and get money, but to participate as part of a collectivist process that ensures mm -hmm. and, and perpetuates good character, uh, or what we call Iwapuele in, in Yoruba, um, or, or perpetuates uh, an opportunity to have a good name in the world, which is also very much Af part of African centric practice and leadership. What is, wh how do you have a good name to the community that you're representing? And how do you under understand that in, in, um, in terms of practice of Isusu? Um, so there's to me a lot lost with uh, a lot of these um, practices that don't really have, um, that aren't rooted in some sense of indigenous knowledge or, or practice or, or at least understanding or care for it, for what the, what the implications are for not acknowledging them. Oh yeah, I mean, as deep though. Um, what I always found with those, Mark, I, 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 I guess what they call, I call it a pyramid scheme, but there is a, a different word that they use. But oftentimes, you know, for me, it's like if it seems like magic, like oh, I only put in fifty dollars, and then in six months, I'm gonna get seven hundred dollars. Wow. That, I mean, you know, if it, it feels like magic and you can't see the connections to how the money is moving, because really it's about the movement and the money is just a representation of the energy. So keep clear where your right. money is moving. So if, if it doesn't, if that part is cloudy, then you can pretty much <laughs> anticipate, you know, cloudy skies going forward. And they I say think that yeah the, what do they call that the, the sunshine putting the sunshine on it uh is you know it, that's what makes it a susu really yeah right they I mean, say there's a fog in the pulpit there's a if there's a mist in the pulpit there's a fog in the pew yeah <laughs> oh man i love that uh -oh. yes yes dr tony adams i give him credit for that one ah uh, i heard that i heard mm. that um, so yeah, that's that's my statement on that one. Yeah. No, no, that I mean, and, and I think that that's that's wonderful. You know, we've given it treatment. You know, and ultimately, um, the 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 thing that I wanted to make sure that you know came through clearly um, here was just that you know um, there's a culture around the susu, there's a culture around money pooling, um, there's a spirit around why we do it. Um, and there, there are certain values that we bring to it. You know, some of those values are very explicit. Some of those values are more implicit. Um, and I, just before today's broadcast, I was going back and listening to um, Dr. Caroline Shanaz Hussein, um, you know, the banker lady's documentary that she did um, yeah. in 2021. You know, and that was great. Yeah, and I mean, in the story that that she shares at the beginning, there is that you know, um, there's a, a a man in you know in Canada, you know. Um, likely from the Caribbean of some sort, you know, but he's going into a bank and he's made some extra money on the sale of a house and the bank, you know, accuses him of stealing the money, you know, and I mean, they call the police. And so he's shamed in the context of a money transaction. And so if we are not, you know, um, decolonizing our experience of money, if we are not relief, releasing ourselves from shame in these spaces, then these spaces are ultimately just replicating, you know, our terrible experience with this other economic system. So. You know, I, I yeah. you all sharing your your thoughts and your values on that. Um, 
are there you know um, other things that you want folks to know in the ter in terms of thinking of wealth as a communally held concept? Um, you know, I know that you know there there are projects happening in, in both spaces, you know, in Chicago and in the Bay. You know, um, so wealth is a communal concept related to this concept of Susu. Hmm. Uh, well, again, I mentioned like, you know, the Oakland Black Business Fund is one in particular that really um, is jumping out at me um, because I know that the sister who kind of started that was with the idea of raising something like, uh, I want to say ten or $20,000 to help businesses that had been um, physically affected, you know, their, their brick and mortar had been damaged during the riots or the yeah, the riots that happened um, in the unrest after George Floyd's murder. Um, what she started out with was a very laudable uh, goal, but she ended up raising something like $3 million, a million dollars, million and a half dollars. And that was, well, in the millions, we'll just put it there. And that was, um, you know, a further example of people wanting to contribute and wanted to put in, in my opinion, in order for things to improve um, for the community at large. Um, so that's a that's one example that comes to mind that's active right now or has been active right now, and they're growing and they're they're um, bringing things forward. Um, the spiritual aspect of it, though, the part around what we need to do to energize the the resources and um you know bring in the ancestral support um i think it's still growing here i don't see any actual organizations doing that here mm -hmm. people are collecting funds they're distributing funds with the very best intentions and um and it's making an, it's making a dent but i i feel that yeah, some of the circles that I uh, I participated in um, in the times when I was building Susu uh, more actively, you know, what we one of the things we did uh, was take the money, the literally the money, and put it in water with you know some Florida water and some herbs and some calories. And literally, you know, let it like cleanse itself, cleanse it so that the intentions that we put on it were fresh and um, and authentic. Um, I do that sometimes just on my own, in my own house. <laughs> uh, I have not um, reinitiated SUSU uh, this year in 2020, but 2021 is an activated year. So I'm excited to, um, and that's one another reason why I was like, oh, I'm so juiced to be on this call with Deirdre and Mike, because then I can get, you know, that's just further inspiration and, and um, yeah, circling back and making those connections. So, so thank you so much again for the invitation to be here and the opportunity to share. Yes, that's beautiful. I, I agree that uh, 2021 is, I, I I really do pray that we take all of the opportunities that have come from being uh, being made to really do a lot of reflective work in this year. <laughs> uh, this has been a year yeah. of a lot of really important uh, reflective work, um, and I pray we take that into this new year and um, and and help that manifest the the world that we all know we should. And should what should cultivate and 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 live in, and um, and I'd like to connect the whole idea of health and wealth um, together in that mm -hmm. sense, and um, and say that I think that a lot of uh, the Asusa work um, actually looks at those two things together, and I think what you just That's talked right. about is looking yeah. at the intentions around how we work with money and spiritually. So that that is very much a health conscious. Uh, effort um, because we are really undoing a lot of patterns that are born out of uh, the coloniality that we're all um, forced to live within. And that has produced very unhealthy outcomes for us uh, spiritually, emotionally, financially. So that, so, so doing that intentional work, I think will definitely bring on, uh, bring us into a better, healthy and balanced life. Mm 
as as people, as collective and as people. Ashe, I'm with that. Absolutely. And um, you all uh, should see in the comments there, you know, I've added uh, the link to the Banker Ladies documentary by uh, Diverse Solidarity Economies uh, Collective and Dr. Caroline, Caroline Shanaz Hussein. Um, so I certainly recommend that, you know, folks go out and check out that documentary, you know, check out the text by that same, uh, by members of that same collective, The Black Social Economy in the Americas. Um, so dig into that. Um, definitely dig into the previous uh, episode uh, with Yavet, um, you know, just talking about some of the other work that's happening there in the Bay Area. Um, and, you know, go back to that episode with uh, Dr. Kamal Rashid, you know, and, and the work that um, and what uh, we spoke about in terms of connecting this to um, the political history of Tanzania and Ujima, um, you know, as a sort of broader political concept. Um, you know, so we, we want to root ourselves in all of those pieces. Um, so I, I want to, you know, yield the floor to um, to Deidre and Yavette, you know, for any closing thoughts you all might have for um, the viewers, listeners, guests. Um, do you want to go first, Deidre? I was going to yield to you. <laughs> okay, fine, that's good. I am uh, just thrilled about again, being in conversation with you all here and, and the inspiration has been um, really deep and rich. And I'm really hoping that folks are... Okay. Come right back to you on that in a moment, possibly. Sure. Um, I, I just want to say, I'm so glad to be in space with, uh, with Yvette today and of course with you. Uh, tech and just uh, know that I'm really, um, I'm really actually really grateful to have an opportunity to talk about this. And, um, and I think the more we raise consciousness about really what the truth Susu practices are, uh, the better opportunity we have to help people to find and engage in true uh, practice around um, recentering our un, uh, healthy uh, relationships to to money and money and and solidarity economies. Uh, so I'm glad to be a part of that work and um, and and glad to be here uh, today sharing uh, sharing this platform with you all. Oh, okay, and uh, yeah, it looks like yeah yeah bet um, got bounced off there. So you know we we uh, definitely wish well there. Um, so, you know, I, I, I appreciate you coming on to, to share your thoughts and share the practice of Isuzu Chicago. Um, are there, I mean, you, you, you all talked a little bit about the invitation, you know, but um, are there things folks should know about, I mean, they just got to wait until they get the invitation. They got to wait till they know somebody to know somebody. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So Isuzu's normally have rounds. So normally uh, it's, you will, well, a person would not get an invitation while a round is underway. So it's good to connect with the person prior to the next round that's coming uh, and um, and find ways to be connected in other ways. If this who has social gatherings or has other things that give uh, opportunities for those that are not a part of the current round to be connected, take advantage of those. But other than that, uh, it is by invitation. It's true for us as well. Uh, we, we do by invitation and by, by familiar in invitation. Um, that, that helps a lot uh, with, with uh, people feeling connected to, um, to someone in, in the practice. Okay, okay. And Yavet has uh, dropped back in. So Yavet, just want, did you want to continue your closing thoughts you were offering? Um, you know, I was just about to, I was only saying thank you, and I was going to uh, invite folks to check up with you and, um, you know, reiterating the emphasis on the uh, health and wellness connected to healthy um, economy and really, um, yeah, put emphasis there. And uh, to check us out, you can go to calvaryvillage.org or you can go to baobabdirectory.com. That's B A O B O B, even though it sounds like the tree. <laughs> yes. Um, so do make sure that you all are checking out those uh, links. You know, uh, calorievillage.org is uh, going to be there in the comment section for you all. 
um, you know, and, and uh, yeah, you know, get into the get into the practice, get into the sort of culture um, by many names, uh, Gamiya, Arasan, Atega, Shuntas, Chitu, Hui, Eku, Cheat Box, um, Hunt, Hand, whatever, whatever, you know, you call it. Um, these are the practices that we draw with us um, of cooperation, uh, because ultimately, wherever we uh, are on the planet, you know, we have found a way to link arms, lock arms, lock experiences and, you know, help to lift one another up. Um, not towards the goal of, you know, individual enrichment, but towards the goal of this collective, this shared enrichment um, that, that ultimately, you know, um, is the thing that holds us. It's an ecosystem. It's a web. Uh, and, you know, and, and uh, Deidre and Yavet have helped us to understand that web today. So thank you uh, both for being on. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> wonderful. All right. Looking forward to the next. Yeah, so let's stay connected, Yvette. Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. You're not going to be able to get rid of me now. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. All right, All right love. Have a beautiful rest of your day and a wonderful holiday and balance of Kwanzaa. Abare Gani. Abare Gani. Yes. All right. Peace. All right, folks, uh, that has been another edition of the Ujima Hour, the special edition uh, dealing with the, the concept of uh, Kwanzaa uh, stating cooperative economics and or and familyhood. Um, so thank you all for tuning in. Um, look for this uh, episode at some point to go up on the podcast um, so you can go ahead and listen in to, to you know, what uh, Deidre and uh, Yavette were speaking about. Um, and I will be back here with another episode on Thursday with Maida McNeil. Um, so we'll be uh, revisiting the conversation we had earlier in the year with Maida, um, you know, which had some technical issues on the audio. Uh, but, you know, um, ideally, we, 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 we're getting this thing down, you know. I mean, I'm, I might be, you know, a sound engineer in my next life um, if it continues like this. But, uh, yeah, so drop, drop back in Thursday for that conversation with Maida McNeil. Um, we'll be going ahead and touching upon uh, Nia, you know, at that, at that stage. Um, so, yes, um, please uh, check, check us out then. Um, until then, uh, I bid you all peace. Uh, thank you for dropping in. <laughs>